Hey, hi! Welcome back to part two of the Great Depression. Uh, this part will be more chicks, so that'll be more fun. All right, next slide. So, oh, then, oh, but here's some not chick stuff. Gosh, I lied to you. I'm a lying liar who lies. Anyway, I talked to you about Franklin Delano Roosevelt and how he instituted the Great De the New Deal and how that was meant to help, but I didn't tell you what it was. So here's when I do that. The New Deal really had two prongs. Uh, the first one was programs aimed at preventing the Depression uh, from happening ever again, or preventing a, a Depression that bad from ever happening again. And so we got things that we still have today. For example, the FDIC, which is banking insurance, uh, we still have that today. So the idea is if your bank fails, so for example, in the last, the recession that happened uh, not, uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago when the banks ca crashed the economy, my bank, Washington Mutual, closed. But I didn't lose the money I had in Washington Mutual because the FDIC had it insured. I, I think you, it's the Federal Deposit Insurance is up to a quarter million dollars uh, in a bank you get back. Um, and you shouldn't have more than a quarter million dollars in a bank. You should put it someplace else if you have that much money. Don't keep that in your checking account. What are you thinking? Anyway, uh, uh, also, oh, Social Security is another New Deal measure designed to keep things from happening. Again, that is in a world where older adults, older working adults, have some workers' retirement insurance, and that's what Social Security is. Um, that's going to help in an economic downturn because you're not going to have a whole bunch of old people, the equivalent of Martha Ballard, wandering around uh, hacking at the fence because they don't have any firewood. Right? Remember that from Martha Ballard? So uh, Social Security, and indeed Social Security is a, a hallmark social welfare program. And I mentioned this in part one, and I said, oh, no, welfare. It's the W word. Oh, scary. But welfare just means for the good of the people. So a social welfare program is a program designed to help the people. And Social Security is a perfect example of it. It's not a handout. Uh, that, that social Security is not the government giving you anything. You pay into it, you get the money back. Uh, but it's a social welfare program in the sense that the federal government is in charge of keeping that money for you. Because... Most of you aren't going to save it on yourself. You're going to piss it off on Del Taco and, 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 and mochas uh, from Starbucks. And so that every, every time you get paid, uh, that some money is taken out of your paycheck and, and stuck uh, in your Social Security account. Not yours. A big, it's a big, but anyway, you get the point, right? The other thing the New Deal did was, uh, have a, was, it was a jobs program. Uh, and so there was a bunch of different, there was a bunch of different agencies designed to create jobs. Uh, and I could name them here, but this isn't that lecture, but suffice it to say. And there were, there was like, there was a one agency that was designed to put like artists back to work. So they paid people to paint murals in buildings, to make public statues, to write plays that would make people feel better. Um, there was a one program that was designed to put young men back to work building roads and, and trails in, in parks. In federal parks, so you still have those those roads and trails still exist today. As the California is full of them, uh, etc., etc., etc. Anyway, uh, it is worth saying that while the New Deal helped everyone, and some programs were better than others, most of them were better at helping white people than not white people, and that is a as a signal failing of the federal government to this day. So lest we get too celebratory about the New Deal, it was as unfair as anything federal has ever been. Not totally unfair, but not perfect. Right? Good. Next slide. Uh, during the Great Depression, the number of married women working at wages doubled. And this is a marker that women's historians always like to keep track of because well, working class women have always worked and have always had to because a stay-at-home mom is a luxury that poor people can't afford. Middle class women, historically, even if they got to go to college and get a job for a while, they historically quit work when they got married. And so married women working is sort of a measure of one, 
women's input in the family that families needed during the Great Depression, much like they do now, both people to be working, but also maybe a signal of the increasing that some women want to continue to work after marriage. Many women, certainly myself, probably many of the people hearing you, you don't want to get a college degree, get this cool career, and then stop the first second uh, you see a man um, and, and want to get married. Ugh, no. Um, also, the man probably doesn't want that either. If he's got any brains, he doesn't. Um, so, so it's also about sort of women's ability to choose uh, their life, which is cool. The percentage of wage women worked. So the percentage of women working in wages in America went from 23% to 25%. Uh, that doesn't seem like a ton. But 2% overall in, at a time of 25% or more unemployment. That's a big deal. Because remember, we got ongoing unemployment problems. Lots of women found uh, jobs working at New Deal programs. Both of my grandmas did. Indeed, both of my grandmas, the Works Progress Administration, the WPA, built a ton of dams in America, the most famous of which is the Hoover Dam out there in Nevada, but lots of dams on the Missouri River, for example, uh, at, at dams in Oregon, Washington, all over the West. And, 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 and both of my grandmas in different states worked as cooks at these dam projects. That is, you'd bring all these men together to build this dam, usually in the middle of nowhere, um, and so you'd have to set up kind of, you know, like the industrial town, like like we talked about with the workers thing with a uh, Lowell, um, and 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 you'd have to feed all the workers. And my grandmas both worked as cooks at that, so they had short-term jobs during these dam projects. Um, and both of their husbands, my my dad's father was just a laborer on the Fort Peck Dam. Uh, my mom's father was a plumber on a dam um, up near Seattle. Works pro oh, Works Progress Administration. I just told you about that. Darn. So here's the WPA. And, and the idea was this was a jobs program. And it was pretty good at creating jobs for both men and women. Like in these dam projects, like the and I know the Fort Peck Dam in East Montana better statistically than I do any of the other ones. Um, uh, the, the Fort Peck Dam created, and I'm going to show you some pictures of it in a second. Well, let's just do that now. Hold on. Let's go to the next slide. Fort Peck Dam uh, created uh, 10,000 jobs for men working at the dam. And then another 10,000 jobs that would have been mixed male and female, what we call auxiliary jobs. That is, the WPA hired mostly male workers, though both of my grandmothers were hired by the WPA to be cooks for the male workers. But then you'd have, uh, like this little picture in black and white, these little towns that would grow up around these projects, and you'd have all sorts of people, men and women, working in the businesses that would support the fact that suddenly out of nowhere 10,000 workers had showed up to build this dam. So, you know, people who worked in the store, in the gas station, in the theaters, in the churches, all that stuff. And whorehouses. My uh, dad's Aunt Ruby worked in a whorehouse in this little town called Fort Peck outside of uh, uh, Fort Peck Dam. Don't tell him I told you that because he thinks it's embarrassing. I, I think it's kind of titillating and thrilling to be related to uh, 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 Aunt Ruby. Anyway, next slide. There she is. Now, you're going to watch a video about her. So I don't want to, uh, I don't want to talk about it a whole lot because you're going to know as much as you need to know about Dorothea Lang by watching the video. But suffice it to say that what I'm about to, remember like the great, the great, the American Revolution and then I told you, about all these women. I gave you a woman example for each thing. We're about to do that. I'm about to give you a, a list of women that you can hang a historical hat on. So Dorothea Lange is for sure one of the most notable or famous women of the Great Depression because she is quite literally the Depression's photographer. And, and, and she liked to have her picture, she would like to, she sat on top of things to have her picture because we'll see in the next slide, she had polio as a child, and one of her legs was a little shorter than the other, and so she stood at kind of a kilter, and she was a little self-conscious about that. 
but she'd sit on top of a car and she'd be big as perfect as anyone. Yeah, even people in the past were funny about stuff, huh? Next slide. She's born in 1895. For goodness sake, don't mer don't uh, don't memorize that. But know that by the 1930s, uh, she's she's a, sort of in the prime of her womanhood. She's not a kid. She's not an old lady. Uh, her, she was raised by a single mom. Her father abandoned the family. She changed her mother, her name to her mother's maiden name when she was a little girl. She uh, she had polio when she was a kid. The same polio epidemic that put the president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, into a wheelchair for the rest of his life. And then in 1935, she was a photographer working, uh, taking studio pictures, right? Sort of, you know, I want to take a picture of the family. Uh, I want to take a picture of, of the kids. You hire that person. She was doing that. Um, when she went out and she took, I'm going to show you a picture next. And on this, the basis of this next picture that she took, she got a job for the FSA, the Farm Security Administration. And they literally hired her to go out and take pictures of the Great Depression. And by the way, that migrant mother picture, that date's wrong. I should fix that, but I probably will forget. It's not 1963. It's 1936. 1936. Anyway, let's go look at the uh, Angel Breadline picture. Next slide. She was working as a studio photographer at one day, and a client didn't show up, and she was just standing there. She had a second-floor office in San Francisco, and she looked out the window, and there were all these men standing in line, and she thought, why am I standing in here taking pictures of rich people when that's happening out there? So she grabbed uh, her portable camera, and, and she went outside, and she took some pictures of the guy standing in line in this picture uh, of this old feller, uh, White Angel Breadline. Um, it, it it got published in the local paper. It got her some play as like as like kind of a notable picture of the Great Depression, um, and it got her the FSA job. So then, working for the um, Farm Security Administration, she was paid uh, to drive around the country and take pictures of people. So let's look at some of those pictures in the next slide. Okay, this is a whole selection. I would encourage you to put Dorothea Lang into Google's, uh, to Google her and then click images and you'll just see a ton of pictures. Uh, I gave you this tiny selection of them and what I like is none of these are her famous pictures. Um, Angel Breadline is moderately famous. Migrant Mother is by far the most famous. We're going to see in the next slide some kind of famous um, Japanese relocation pictures. But, um, um, but what she did, I think, really well is take pictures of everyone. Uh, Mexican migrant workers, oh, old people, uh, families, African Americans. Dorothea Lang went everywhere and took pictures of everyone. And what you see in these pictures is, is a tremendous empathy for the, the, the people who were caught in the ringer of this economic downturn. Um, it is, it's hard to believe the federal government now, can you imagine the current president, uh, the orange guy, hiring a photographer to go out and take pictures of how badly his government was failing the people. It's like incomprehensible to us. And yet uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, we are not doing a good job. Go out and take pictures of it which is astounding. It's the difference between democracy and a fascist crazy man. Anyway, I'm cranky right now because in the middle of the COVID thing, I am unamused by the current president. And if you dig in, I can only apologize and be, I'm going to be honest, wonder why. But anyway, pictures. Let's go see the next slide. Also then, uh, when, the, when the World War II started, in World War II, I will talk about this next week, uh, World War II essentially ended the Great Depression by ending joblessness in America for a time. Uh, and, and one of the things that, one of the huge mistakes that Franklin Delano Roosevelt did, or one of the bad things he did, is he signed Executive, 9, or, 9, Executive Order 9066, which ordered that all Japanese immigrants, both the ones who had been born in Japan and came here, and the Japanese, the people of Japanese descent who were born here, he ordered those people all rounded up and put in camps. It's bad. Um, bad. And we'll talk about it uh, uh, next week um, when we do the World War II lecture. But the War Relocation Authority 
hired Dorothea Lang to take pictures of, of the relocation process. And what happened is the WRA, I think, didn't understand who they'd hired to take these pictures. So she took a bunch of pictures, she sent them in, and they said, oh, holy shit. And, and then for the next 40 years, all of those pictures were classified by the government and nobody was allowed to use them. They were unclassified a couple of decades ago, and so for the first time in American history, we saw them. Um, but, but what's astounding about that is that Dorothea Lang took pictures that made it clear that this was wrong. That with the very images she took, she made it clear that the United States of America was violating the civil rights of people who had done nothing wrong. And you see these yeah, it's pictures. I don't want to. I don't need to describe the pictures. Just look at them, and 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 sort of read them. What's in those pictures? What does it say? What are the myriad of emotions from each each picture? And you can see it. So, ah, oh, tremendously talented lady. Speaking of talented ladies, next slide. Um, she was every pro well not every bit. I don't know if any American photographers is famous as Dorothea Lang, um, but Margaret Burke White, close to as famous, but Dorothea Lang took pictures of people, and that's why she's my favorite. Margaret Burke White was more likely to take industrial pictures. Uh, that center picture is a self-portrait. She put a big camera on a timer and put it on one of those eagles, and then she, this is, this is at the Chrysler building in Chicago, and then she crawled out there on that other eagle to take a picture of herself taking a picture. And then you have uh, on the left, picture, she, she did a lot of pictures of people working and then she, she liked these sort of photographs where she photographed industrial stuff looking kind of like abstract art. The other really famous uh, 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 photographer of the Great Depression was Ansel Adams who well, you've probably seen his photographs even if you don't know. They're kind of iconic black and white pictures of, of, of the California wilderness. Uh, and, and the reason I don't have him here is one, he's a dude, um, well, and two, he's a dude. He's a, also a great photographer, but Ansel Adams took uh, 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 landscape photographs. So Dorothea took pictures of people, Margaret Burke White took industrial photographs, and Ansel Adams took nature pictures. And if you're like, I don't know what you're talking about, go Google Ansel Adams and I bet you you have seen some of his prints. Next slide, let's look at another cool lady. Margaret McLeod Bethune. Oh my god, what a stud. Uh, so FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president, who was a massive do-gooder, uh, did not have any black people in his cabinet. So not unlike President Trump. Um, um, but I'm not counting that doofus, that doctor guy, because he's, he doesn't count. Um, ben Carson, yeah, no, he doesn't count. That's not that Uncle Sam. Uh, but, but, but what he did do is he recognized that while the, America would go nuts if he put black people on his cabinet, that is the really big post, you know, Secretary of Housing, Secretary of State, Secretary of all those, what he could do is he could have an unofficial black cabinet. So he essentially got himself together some sort of what he, they saw sort of the leaders, the important people uh, uh, in, in, in various and sundry fields, and, and they became his unofficial black cabinet and, and advised him on matters uh, of race. And the leader of that black cabinet uh, was Mary McLeod Bethune. So let's go to the next slide, and, and I'll tell you some stuff about her. That'll be fun. Yeah. Uh, was born... Uh, her parents were slaves, um, but she was not. She was born free in 1975. Uh, she, uh, when she was a very young woman, she started a school for black children in Florida. Florida, a southern state and a segregated state, and, and sometimes segregation meant there was a school for white kids and no school for black kids. So when she was like 17, she started a school for black kids. She then became the co-founder of the National Association of Colored Women, an organization that still exists today. Uh, then she became the founder of the National Council of Negro Women, 
an organization that still exists today. Both of them uh, uh, advocate for the rights of women of color. Excuse me. <coughs> no! Ah, it's a pollen count. Uh, it's, it's not the COVID. Um, um, and then she was, and this is how she's the unofficial cabinet member. She was a special assistant to the Secretary of War during World War II, a advising uh, both the Secretary of War and the President on the roles black Americans could play in the, role, in the war. So she's an immensely important woman who you'll probably never hear of again. One of those ladies who did a lot for America and for uh, uh, black Americans, and, but, but, but not a flashy person who was particularly interested in getting a lot of credit. So I think it's one of the things that makes her cool. All right, next slide. I have a huge weakness for Anna Mae Wong. Uh, uh, we have her here because I don't get a lot of chances to have Asian American women in my American history class, in part because Asian Americans make up a very tiny racial group in American history pretty much until like the 1970s. Very tiny group. But I have Anna Mae Wong. I look at her. Isn't she pretty? Uh, let's go look at the next slide, and I'll tell you some stuff about Anna, because she's not just pretty. She's many other things. Chinese American. Her parents came here from China. She was born in Los Angeles in Chinatown. Back when it was, it, Chinatown used to be where Union Station is now. When they wanted to build Union Station, they moved Chinatown to where it is now, which is just next door. Um, but anyway, she's born down there. A lot of the film industry was in L.A., of course, in the 30s, 20s and 30s, and they used to film a lot of stuff in Chinatown because it was, you know, exotic, and you could pass it off as China. Uh, and she would go down and she would just watch them filming, and that got her thinking maybe she could be an actress at a time when there were no Asian actresses. Um, and so she worked her way into the films in the 1930s. Um, she ended up playing... Like, um, when we did the slavery lecture and I talked about Hattie McDaniels, the woman who played um, Mammy in Gone with the Wind, and, you know, Mammy, Hattie, Hattie McDaniels ended up playing a lot of those kinds of characters in her life. Uh, she, and, and she said famously that she'd rather play a maid in the movies for $300 a week than be a maid in real life for $300 a month. Um, the reality is, and the black community often gave Hattie McDaniels a hard time for playing these maids in the movies, is Hattie didn't have much choice. There weren't very good roles for black women, and that's absolutely true for Anna Mae Wong as well. She, pay, she played a lot of what we call dragon lady stereotypes. There's sort of the dangerous, hypersexual Asian lady. Oh, so smoky and sultry and dangerous and mysterious. Um... But she worked as an actress, and she did what she could do, and she, it's not her fault she ended up playing these sort of Asian stereotypes. Lucy Liu ended up, had, in, early in her career, played a lot of Asian stereotypes, too. It wasn't Lucy Liu's fault, either, and she's fabulous. Um, anyway, uh, in the, the late 1930s, because World War II started for America in, in December of 1941, but in China it started in 1938 when Japan attacked... China and did terrible, terrible things in China. Uh, uh, and so Anna Mae Wong was on the front line of getting the federal government to let more Chinese immigrants into the United States so that they could get away from the Japanese acting badly in China. And then during the war, uh, she sold war bonds. A lot of actresses, actresses and actors sold war bonds, which was a way that you could raise money for the federal government to um, help fund this immensely expensive war. And we'll talk about the war next week, so I don't want to do much of it that week. Uh, so so a, a pretty interesting lady. You have a reading about her, and what most students remember is that she struggled with alcohol and died tragically, kind of too young, from liver failure. But um, a pretty great woman who did a fair bit in a world that said that Asian American women shouldn't achieve anything. Uh, next slide. This Perkins. Peeps, you should have heard of this woman. This probably should be, Frances Perkins should be one of the most famous people in American history. Because she brought you two things. No, three things that you think are really, really, really important. 
She was she was a friend of the Roosevelts, and she helped Roosevelt work on the New Deal even before he was elected. The second he was elected, uh, the very first person he elected to his cabinet was uh, that he uh, he didn't elect people. He appointed her to his cabinet was Frances Perkins. He appointed her the Secretary of Labor. And you guys, that's a you may like Secretary of Labor. I've never even heard of it. But in a Great Depression with 25 to 35 uh, percent unemployment. The Secretary of Labor is probably the most important cabinet member. And Frances Perkin is not only that person, she's the very first female cabinet member ever. Um, she is the architect of the Social Security Act. So the very fact that the federal government has in place a system to help people with their retirement, that's Frances Perkins. You can thank the Democrats, you can thank Frederick Franklin Delano Roosevelt, but first and foremost, you should thank France, Frances Perkins for that, because that was her idea, and she not only thought it up and worked out the details, she pushed it through and made it happen. She also worked really hard to establish the first federal minimum wage, so this notion that there's some, there's some amount at which people need to be paid so that they can pay their rent and buy food and the occasional piece of clothing that 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 there's a that there's a minimum amount that you can pay people so that they can pay their bills uh, that's Francis Perkin who said we should not only figure out what that is but then we should pass a law that say that workers that owners have to pay people that well you can imagine how much owners like that they still don't look it, like it so the federal minimum wage is fundamentally about protecting workers and you can bet that Francis, work, Francis Perkins came from a union background. Can't you? You can. Uh, and she's also on the forefront of ending child labor. And as I said a couple of lectures ago, the key to ending child labor was that Francis Perkins and a number of other women, and I can say, I can point straight to her in the Social Security Act, um, and, and can point straight to her in the minimum wage, but she's just part of a whole group of women who worked to end child labor. It was really hard to do in America, and the only way that women finally pulled it off is, is mandatory school attendance. That's how you end child labor in America. Instead of saying women can't, we, kids can't go to work in factories, you say kids have to be in school, which is really smart. Anyway, next slide. She is. You guys, you, I know no one has heard of her. Frances Perkins. My God. What a person. I think in a fairer and more decent world, she'd have made a great president. But then, so would a lot of women. Of course, the standard these days isn't that high. Anyway, uh, I'm, we'll go to the last slide, which is just, right, just where I tell you what I want you to do next. Um, um, if you started by watching the notes, and I, I, th I assume that's where you start, but maybe it's not. Maybe you already watched this, but if you didn't, I also have something on Canvas. There's a little, I want you to do that, and here's the direction sheet for it. But here it is, too. Um, that's the YouTube video. Um, it's free. Watch that and make a list. I can't remember exactly what I said. Go back to Canvas and find the little instruction sheet for it. Uh, and do what it says so that I don't tell you the wrong thing here. But uh, you're going to learn more about Dorothea Lang and the Great Depression. And I think you'll enjoy it because she's, she's almost as cool as Frances Perkins. So, And also, I think it's helpful to watch something about Frances Perkins as a politician. Dorothea Lang as an artist. And I think it's helpful to not just look at different sort of racial groups of women or socioeconomic groups of women but uh, different kinds of women who did different kinds of things. And so we don't often pay much attention to artists, which is one of the reasons I chose her. So anyway, uh, that is that. That is the end of the Great Depression uh, lecture. You have then three things for me this week. You have your lecture notes to send me. You'll have your uh, the second half of Little by Little We Won to send me, uh, the, the novel. And there's questions for that. They, too, are up on Canvas. And then you have this list for the video, okay? And if you're wondering, why did I add a third thing? It's because uh, if we'd have been in class, 
uh, a bunch of the other weeks, I'd have had things we could have done. I would have lectured for an hour, hour and 20, and then we'd have done something to make up the rest of the class time, some kind of class activity. Later in the semester, when I knew students were getting tired, instead of having a class activity, I would say, go home and watch this video, and then I would let students out early. So you got to miss out on the activities, which is unfortunate, but, you know, COVID. Um, and, but, but now here's the videos, and I don't want to skip those. So there you have it. If you've gotten this far in the women's history course, congratulations. I, I, I know I keep saying this, and I sound like a broken record and a suck-up, but I am genuinely proud of each and every one of you. I mean, it's, it would have just been so easy to say, oh, to heck with it. I'm just going to drop History 36. This is too hard. Times are too huff, tough. Tough. Huff. <laughs> It had just been so easy to quit. And, and, and they say that community college students aren't prepared to do hard things, and they tend not to be resilient. And I'm going to tell you, that's not my experience. So, I, again, I'm just, I, keep up the good work. You're doing really good. I bet you I'm going to give a lot of A's. Um, so great. Okay? And then don't forget to go out there and have some fun and spread the love. But, you know, don't touch anybody and don't lick anybody's face. Right? Okay, take care. Bye.